I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from God, who made heaven and earth. God will not let your foot be moved. God, who keeps you, will not slumber. God, who keeps Israel, will neither slumber nor sleep. God is your keeper. God is your shade at your side. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. God will keep you from evil. God will keep your life. God will keep you going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. My help comes from God. Our second reading is from the fourth chapter of Romans. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, an ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him, who who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the earth did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there a violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For as it is, he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning we move from Matthew to the Gospel of John, the third chapter. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I have said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And this next verse I suspect you can all say by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace belong to you. They are free gifts from the one who was and is and is to come. Did you happen to notice the title of the prelude that Sharon played a few minutes ago? It was called, Does Jesus Care? Do you ever feel that way? Not only whether Jesus cares, but does anyone at all care about you? Sometimes life can just feel that way. If you've ever wondered if anyone's paying attention, if you've ever wondered why your life is playing out the way it is, if you've ever wondered whether there's any meaning to anything, if you've ever been uncertain about which way to turn, then Psalm 121, this little eight-verse conversation between a priest and a pilgrim, well, it just might have your name on it. As best anyone knows, this eloquent expression of faith in God's providence and protection was composed sometime in the fifth century before Christ, a time when the people of Israel were returning from decades of captivity at the hands of the Babylonians in what is now modern day Iraq. If you've been attending our introduction to Bible classes, which re are resuming today, you know that this was a time in the ancient Middle East when much of what we know as the Old Testament was actually written. If anyone, if anyone ever felt alone and abandoned, even disoriented, it was the people of Israel living in this post-exile world. Life had been totally turned upside down. God's chosen people were scattered all over the place, and the temple where people believed God dwelled had been destroyed. Not only was there no longer a center of faith, life itself lacked any direction. Where did God go? And what do we do now? Indeed, this image of exile and return, of loss and wandering and redemption, of going and coming, all of this mirrors the great story of the Exodus when the Hebrews were led out of Egypt by God, by cloud and by fire, going they knew not where, only that their destination was the promised land. From the beginning, or so it seems. The Hebrew people were always people en route, or as the later followers of Jesus call themselves, they were people of the way. They were sojourners, people always in transit, on the move, always going somewhere, but never quite arriving. Following in the footsteps of Abram and Sarai, stepping out in faith, a people always in the process of becoming what God would have them to be. Now for us as Christians, the roots of our becoming are grounded in Psalm 121, which forms the benediction of our journey along the path of this life toward the next. So this morning I invite you to join with me as we listen to another round of sacred conversations or praying through the Psalms, 
as we enter into the second week of Lent on our journey with Jesus into Holy Week. Now personally, I love the imagery at the beginning of Psalm 121. Largely, I suppose, because I spent 19 years of my life living in the foothills and the mountains of Colorado. Often I would think of that opening line, I lift up my eyes to the hills. As I would head up from Denver toward my home near Vail, where the peace and strength of the views just seemed to pull me in like the homing beam to an airplane. Maybe that's how the psalmist felt. Or maybe for him the mountains and hills had military significance, which they often did in those days, as a fortification. Or maybe they stood for something spiritual, such as heading toward Jerusalem or Mount Zion, a symbol of divine help. Whatever the intention, this psalm over time has come to be grouped with a collection of other psalms, roughly 120 through 134, all aimed at pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem or upon their arrival in the holy city. I'll have more to say about other groupings of psalms during our time of prayer, but for now, this idea of a journey also brings to mind for me a time of my childhood and those meandering drives in the old 52 forward with my father who would just out of the blue command, come on, we're going for a ride. And at that age, those were the most dreaded words in my life. <laughs> because it meant we were going on what I would come to call the road to nowhere. No particular destination other than riding anywhere with the windows down and my father smoking, doubtless trying to clear his mind of something, with me slouched in the back seat whining occasionally, are we there yet? <laughs> then as now, I wanted to be going somewhere for real. Or to be honest, don't we all? But the psalmist's suggestion here is that we can sometimes become so preoccupied with the details of life, of our going out and our coming in, that we miss not only the presence of God, but the beauty of the creation in the sunset over the hills and the poetry of the winding road, the allure of what Robert Frost called the road not taken. Or as we have been saying for a while now, and I hope this is beginning to sink in, ever since our holy nudging sessions of a few months ago, the God we worship and seek is not elsewhere, but here in the ordinary goings out and coming in and in the keeping or guarding our life from evil, as the psalm says. The structure of 121 speaks to the reassurance of that abiding presence of God. You'll notice if you have your Bibles open or if you still have the hymnal on page 704, beginning at verse 3 and continuing to the end, the pervasiveness of the verb to keep. Let's see if I can show you that on the screen. There we go. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and you're coming in. Now some may look askance at that word keep, which the psalmist uses six times in eight verses. As if humanity were some sort of divine pet, much like Cammy and I keep our little dog JJ. But that's not the Hebrew meaning. The Hebrew meaning is better often translated as to guard. The step-by-step -step repetition through each of the verses to keep or to guard calls to mind the process of journeying in the ancient world. 
which was what? Mostly by foot, step by step, one foot in front of the other, always moving forward. So it becomes clear that the very life of the pilgrim in this psalm is the real object of God's care. Every departure and arrival, now and forever, under the watchful eye of the one who walks with us and keeps us or guards us. No place, no time, no circumstance ever able to separate us from God, the God who bends the arc of our journey ever homeward. Much like in some ways how I used to track the movements of my college age kids on their way back home to home base. I would check every few miles to where they ought to be and then I would call, are you there yet? Are you there yet? Even so, well that can sound comforting on the surface. The bootstrap psychology of Western culture which promotes individualism and self-sufficiency, might lead others to take umbrage at the notion of being kept by anyone. But reality is, at some point, we all have to face the knowledge that we, are simply, that we simply cannot be our own gods. We all need help. And there could be a blessedness received in those moments when we become aware of our own powerlessness. It's the calm that comes from surrendering in obedience, knowing that we're headed in the right direction. As we enter deeper into our time of Lenten reflection and our meditations with Nancy, which begin this Wednesday night, my prayer is that we come to know like the, like the Apostle Paul in today's passage from Romans that Mike read, that we come to know that it all depends on faith. Faith that is a free gift, nothing we have to earn, only to trust that the inner nudging which looks to God in the moment for our next step. Now some skeptics and those who have been hurt in some deep and painful way. Might well say that such assurances are pie in the sky, by and by dismissals of how the world really works. But I suggest to you that such concerns, however deeply and honestly felt, miss the truth that however and whenever we lose our grip on God during those difficult times, God as the psalmist promises, never loses God's grip on us. The assurance of that constancy of God's presence is the very form of Jesus, who used the psalms as his prayer book, whose journey to the cross we follow this season. You know, much like my trusty GPS device, my global positioning satellite system, which I carry in my pocket, except when I'm preaching. It's always saying recalculating, recalculating when I take a wrong turn. I put life's unfolding mystery into the hands of the one who carries the whole world, like the children's song said. Just as Abram and Sarah were called to live as sojourners, always on the way, but never quite there yet. Even Jesus characterized his own existence as unsettled, trusting that even on the cross, God meant no harm, and that God continued to keep him through the dark hours of Good Friday and Holy Saturday, promising to bring him through to the other side. In the, in the end, the reality of God is sought and found amid the challenges of our life. For all that we may think we gain through our own effort, our puffed up look at me and look at what I did, we must first give ourselves to the one who offers us protection, 
who assumes responsibility for our safety and our shade, who loves us and therefore keeps us on the way, on the way toward becoming who he would have us to be. So as you seek to make the prayer of Psalm 121 your own, eavesdrop on the petition of the spiritualist Joyce Rupp, who lifts up this plea to God. May we pray. God of the journey, when the road of life seems long and tedious and even fearful, when the dying and rising gets to be too much, be that pillar of fire by night and comforting cloud by day so that we can see our way home. Amen.